and appreciate that this morning. If you have a Bible, that's open there to Ruth chapter number 4. If you'll follow along to read our text this morning, Ruth chapter number 4. To then Boaz, then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that has come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. For if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise it the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming, concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And it was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Malon's, of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come unto thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth. She was his wife. And he went unto her. The Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall go into, unto thee a restorer of life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it upon her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There's a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed, for he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat, begat Aminadab, Menadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the precious word of God. Lord, we thank you for this final chapter in the book of Ruth. Lord, I pray this morning as we have, over the past several weeks, looked at the book, book of Ruth, that Lord, we will understand the conclusion this morning and how important it is, not just simply in the telling of the, the history of Ruth and Boaz, but Lord, what it illustrates for us today. Lord, I pray today that your word will be clearly spoken. Lord, I pray that you would use me. Lord, may I say the things you would have me to, nothing more, nothing less. And may the name of Christ be exalted above all things. In your name we ask it. Amen. Little Johnny had worked long and hard on his little project. He had spent all of about two hours, but it seemed like two years. 
working on his little boat. Daddy had bought him a little boat, a little project, a little model. He had put it together. And he was, he was just, he couldn't wait to take it down to the creek. He wanted to see his little boat sail. Well, being in a hurry and being young, he made one mistake, but he didn't realize it until he got down to the creek. And the wind started blowing. The current got a little strong. He did, his knot just wasn't quite right. And the string holding his boat slipped off, and his boat went right down the creek. Oh, he was broken hard. He had worked so hard for a young kid, so, young, so hard working on that little boat, and that one little mistake. And his boat just went sailing off. He tried to run down, try to catch it, but of course, the current got stronger, the creek got wider, and eventually he had to give up. He couldn't. It was gone. Well, he went home, of course, told mom and dad. Of course, he's all sad. And they're trying to cheer him up and offer to buy him another. I don't know. There's not another boat. I, you know how it is. I want that boat. Well, they take him downtown. They're looking through, just trying to help lift his spirits. And as they're walking down, they pass a thrift store. And in the window of the thrift store is a boat that's exactly like the one he had just lost. He was all excited. He ran into the store. He looked at it, and sure enough, on the bottom, he had written his name. And it was his boat. So he went and told the storekeeper, that's my boat. That's my boat. The gentleman said, I'm sorry, son, but somebody came in a while ago, and I just bought that boat off of him if you want it. It's going to cost you $2. He was all, but that was his boat. Went to mom and mom, dad, we gotta go home, we gotta go home, we gotta go home. Why well, we gotta go home? We gotta go home, we gotta go home right now. So they take him home, they run home, he runs to his bedroom, finds his piggy bank, busts it open, starts counting the change. Dollar twenty-five, dollar thirty-five, dollar fifty-five, dollar seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Two dollars, I got two dollars. Mom, mom, we gotta go back to the store, we gotta go back to the store. Two dollars back to the store. Walks up to the counter, lays all his change on the counter, and says, "That's my boat." And he walks out with the boat. He says, "I made you. Now I bought you. You're mine." Twice. The story that we have this morning in the book of Ruth is very similar. It portrays for us redemption. Redemption. This morning, I want you to understand as we talk about. Yes, the story of Ruth and Boaz and the redemption of the land, it is a picture for us of Christ. Christ has given himself, he has paid the price to redeem all mankind. And if you're saved this morning, you are his twice. He made you and he bought you. If you're here this morning and don't know Christ as your Savior, he made you and he still paid the price. And you can be redeemed this morning. But he is the redeemer. If you're saved this morning, you are his twice. As we look at this passage in Ruth chapter number 12, we're going to talk about a few things, some things dealing with history, not only with Ruth and Boaz, but things that help us understand what's taking place here. But as we think about the idea of redemption, the fact that Christ has paid the price, I have a question. If you're here this morning and don't know Christ as your Savior, since he's already paid the price, why are you refusing his redemption. My second question is for Christians. Christians, we know Christ has bought us, right? We're his twice. He made us. He bought us. Why are, why are we not sharing the story of redemption? If you're not saved, why are you refusing? If you are saved, why aren't you sharing with others God's plan of redemption? He's paid the price for everyone, and it's our responsibility to tell each and every one. This morning as we look at this last chapter of Ruth, we're looking at the bridegroom. We've looked at the book of Ruth for several weeks. We started out in chapter 2 looking at the blessings God has given us. Then we went back to chapter 1, kind of helped us understand what they left behind. And we've seen in chapters 1 and 2, we saw you know, the backslider in chapter 1, the believer in chapter Two, we come to chapter 4, we're looking, where the primary focus is the bridegroom. 
In today's culture, when the wedding comes, what is the focus? The bride, right? In chapter 4, the focus is on the bridegroom. This morning, if you're saved, you're part of the, the bride of Christ. But it's not about us. It's about the bridegroom. It's about Christ himself. As we look at the bridegroom, I want us to see, we're going to look at um, the fact of the Redeemer and the redeemed. In chapter 4, it's what it boils down to. There's the Redeemer, who is Boaz, and then the redeemed. Now, he redeemed more than just Ruth. We're going to look at that. He, he redeemed three things. All dealing with the custom of the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer. Several pastors in the Old Testament tell us about the kinsman redeemer. We won't take time to look at all that this morning. We'll kind of summarize it. But as we look at this last chapter, we're going to focus on the Redeemer and the redeemed. As we look at the Redeemer, we know in our context here, Boaz is the Redeemer. We remember the story of Ruth, how that, you know, of course, it starts with Naomi, her husband, Elimelech, and two children. They go down to Moab. They left Bethlehem, the house of God. House of God. That didn't work out for them. The dad dies. The two boys dies. Not before the two boys got married. Of course, Naomi comes back. She brings back uh, Ruth. It was Ruth's choice to come back with her. And we find in chapter 2 how God blesses them. She finds herself in the field of Boaz, who is a near kinsman. And he is, as we see, see in chapter 4, going to redeem uh, the land and Ruth herself. And then we see in chapter 3 how, of course, Ruth, uh, went in and let him know that, of course, what his responsibilities were as the Redeemer. And as, he, as she did so, of course, remember Boaz tells her uh, the next morning to, to go back, not to tell anyone, not to worry about it. He was going to take care of things. As a matter of fact, we see chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then went Boaz up to the gate. It doesn't say he waited a week. It doesn't say he waited a year. No, he went that very morning. He went to take care of business. And remember Naomi's words, the last verse of chapter 3, what Naomi's words to Ruth, she said to, to Ruth, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know the matter, or how the matter will fall. For the man, Boaz, will not be in rest until he has finished the thing this day. Boaz was a near kinsman. According to the Old Testament, as a near kinsman, he had some responsibilities. He's called the kinsman redeemer. Now, we know in chapter 4, he was not the nearest of kin. We read how that Boaz went to the gate of the city and he waited. What was he waiting for? He was waiting for the kinsman who was closer to, pa to pass by. We don't know who it is. Uh, probably maybe a brother, an older brother. But anyway, he was closer, a closer relative than Boaz. He sees him pass by. He calls the attention. He says, come over here to the gates. Sit down right here. And then he calls ten elders of the city. They are witnesses about what's, what's about to take place. They have the ten witnesses. Then Boaz relates to this other kinsman. We have a responsibility. Naomi has come back from Moab. and She's selling a parcel of land. or has a parcel of land that needs to be redeemed. Because the land was supposed to stay in the family. He says, and you are first in line to buy that piece of land. Nobody stands between you and it, but after you, there's me. So I'm giving you first option. Will you buy the land or will you not? If you don't, I will. Well, of course, you, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll buy the land. But in the next verse, Boaz drops the bomb. But wait a minute. You see, when you buy the land, you're buying it from Naomi and Ruth. And part of your responsibility as a kinsman redeemer, see, Ruth didn't have any children. In the Old Testament, if a man was married and didn't have children, the kinsman redeemer was to marry the widow, to have children by the widow, so that the deceased would have a posterity, leave an inheritance behind. So you have to buy the land, but when you buy the land, you have to marry Ruth. The 
the Moabites. And what was the king's response? It can't do that. No. I cannot, I cannot redeem it. I will mar my inheritance. Now, there's no explanation there about why he says I'll mar my inheritance. Most commentators believe he probably was already married. Which doesn't make sense. It also makes sense with the context. According to the custom of the day, as we've read, since the first kinsman could not redeem it, the, second, the first kinsman took his shoe off and gave it to the next of kin, which is what happened. But according to Old Testament, if a man refused to, not only did he give him the shoe, but the widow came and spat in his face because it was disgraceful. The spitting part is left out in Ruth. Most commentators believe that's probably because he was married, so it wasn't that he would not, but that he could not because he was already married. But nonetheless, we see the picture taking place, right? He hands the shoe to Boaz and says, I cannot redeem it. If you want to, it's all yours. And what does is, what is Boaz do? Yeah, it's not there, I'm sure it's between the lines somewhere. He was happy because he was going to redeem the land. But you know what? It wasn't about the land for him, was it? It was about Ruth. So he is the redeemer. Now, as we look at the redeemer, we, we understand what's taking place here. Even though the kinsman was there, a kinsman had certain for a kinsman redeemer, he had to be a kinsman redeemer. There's certain things that had to be necessary. First of all, he had to be a blood relative. He could not just be a stranger. He couldn't be, you know, the neighbor. He had to be a blood relative. Boaz was a blood relative. Not only was he to be a blood relative, but according to Scripture, he had to be able to redeem the land. Well, what does that mean? It means he had a head of money. But also, as we just mentioned, in redeeming the land, he also had to marry Ruth. The first kinsman was not able to do so, was he? But Boaz was a bachelor. He was able. He had to be a blood relative. He had to be able, but then... He also had to be willing to buy the land. The Old Testament custom did allow for you to refuse to do so. That was an act of disgrace, but it was an option. It wasn't just that you had the ability to do so, but you were willing to buy the land. And then also not only willing to buy the land, but also willing to do what? Marry the widow. And then the fifth requirement was this. The kinsman redeemer had to be a free man. He could not be a servant. He could not be a bond slave. He himself had to be a free man. Because the custom was in the day, if I got in financial hardship and I owed Brother Mike some money, the custom was I could be a hired servant. I wasn't allowed to be a bond servant. I to start with, but I could be a hired servant to pay off my debt. If I was doing that, I could not be a redeemer according to the custom of the day. So the five requirements for a kinsman redeemer, blood relative, able to redeem, willing to buy, willing to marry, and then a free man. As we think of Boaz being the kinsman redeemer, he is a picture of Christ. He is a picture of our redeemer. Jesus Christ is a blood relative. You understand that? He left heaven and put on flesh and blood like you and me. He is a blood relative. He was born of a virgin. He's a blood relative. Not only is he a blood relative, but he is able. The wages of sin is death, but in him there was no sin. He was able to pay the price for our sin because he himself knew no sin. But was he willing? Absolutely, he volunteered. He gave his life a ransom for many. He was willing to buy. But not only was he willing to buy, he was willing to marry. 
because he has for himself a bride, the church, the bride of Christ, he himself being the bridegroom. And he must be a free man. Well, my Lord and Savior is king of kings. He serves no other. He is sovereign. He is free. And this morning, he is my redeemer, and I trust that he is your redeemer. If not, he can be, and he wants to be. But Boaz here is our redeemer. But then notice, as the redeemer, what he redeemed. In verses 1 through 4, it speaks of the property. The near kinsman was to redeem the land. But notice, even though Boaz wanted to redeem the land, Could he to start with? No, there's something stood between him and Ruth, didn't it? A nearer kinsman. The nearer kinsman represents the law. See, what stands between you and Christ is the demands of the law. Ezekiel puts it this way. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The nearer kinsman represents the law. He separates the redeemer from those that would be redeemed. That's why we need a redeemer. That's why we need Christ. The law demanded that the price be paid. The first thing that he's going to redeem, Boaz it is, is the land. I mean, that's what he he proposed to start with, wasn't it? I need to tell you about something. Some land that needs to be redeemed. Oh, I'm willing to do that. But when he find, found out all the details, he wasn't willing, was he? He wasn't able. Do you realize in redemption, we speak of redemption, many times we speak just about the person. But when God redeems, he not only redeems or gives redemption to the person, but he's going to redeem the land. In Genesis chapter 3, turn over there if you, if you will, Genesis chapter 3, You know the story. Genesis chapter number 3, we find the fall of man, sin entering into this world. As a result of that, look at verses 17, 18, and 19. Notice this. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree. In other words, because you sinned. Notice the rest of that verse. Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. A consequence of the fall of man was a curse on this earth. We just read it, did we not? The world is under a curse. Naomi, in our text, she was the one who owned part of the land, was she not? Where does she find herself in this position? In chapter 4. She finds herself lacking, does she not? Relying on a daughter-in-law who has no idea of the customs or anything else going on to try to meet her needs. Naomi is wanting. She is lacking. In the book of Daniel, you remember the story. Remember how the king threw a feast? And he was having a a good old time until he started seeing things. He thought he was seeing things, but then he found out he wasn't seeing, it was real. He saw a finger writing on the wall. You need me need to tell you, Parson? Remember that? And Daniel's called in to interpret. Part of that interpretation is in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 27. When Daniel is interpreting, he says to Kel, which means that you've been weighed in the balances are not found wanting. You're lacking. You don't measure up. You realize that's where we are today? We're lacking. We are, like the king, we've been weighed and 
found wanting or lacking. The unbeliever, that is your case. The one who's not accepted Christ as their Savior. You realize you cannot do anything to earn salvation? You've already been weighed. God already knows everything you're going to do with your life. All the good, all the bad. And he said, you've already been weighed. And I'm here to tell you, you're lacking. Nothing you can do can earn it for you. That's why we need a redeemer. We're weighed and found wanting. When Adam sinned in Genesis chapter 3, not only did he sell himself into sin, but we saw as a direct result from that, he lost his entire estate. He lost this world. God had given it to him, had he not? Amen. Given it to him to multiply, to replenish, to take care of it. It was his. And when he sinned, he lost it all. He lost it all. But Jesus Christ has redeemed it. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter number, well actually Romans chapter 8 first. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22 for we know that the whole earth groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. The whole earth is under the curse. We lost it. Adam lost it. But Christ has redeemed it. We find in Revelation chapter 5, talking about future events being revealed to John. As John sees what's going on in heaven in Revelation chapter 5, we see... They're searching all over heaven for someone to open a book. And no one is found worthy to open that book to start with. In fact, John gets really upset and begins to, to weep. There's no one worthy to open the book. The question is, what is the book? The book is the title deed to this world. And then as John becomes distraught, Someone approaches John and says, in essence, stop weeping. There's one. One worthy to open the book. And he sits on the throne. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the only one worthy to open the title deed to the earth. Why? Because it's his. He made it and he bought it back. He is going to redeem this land. And Revelation 21 verse 1 tells us, John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He has redeemed it. and He will create a new heaven and a new earth. He has redeemed the land. Boaz redeemed the land. But not only did he redeem the land or the, the property, if you will, but secondly, he redeemed the person. In verses 5 through 12, we find that in our text. He redeems Ruth herself. The law required that when Boaz redeemed the land, he also had to redeem Ruth. He purchased the property, but he also had to purchase the person. There is in his words, I have bought to myself Ruth as my wife. He purchased her. The law required that both be redeemed together, not separately. I'm glad that my Redeemer purchased not only the land, but he purchased the person. One day, he will make a new heaven and a new earth. But today, he's still making new creatures. He's saving souls, redeeming them each and every day for whosoever will. Whosoever will. It did not matter to Boaz that Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Gentile. She was an outcast. Not only that, but according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, the Moabites were a cursed people. Do you, do you realize today that we are a cursed people? We're under the curse of sin. And just, just as Boaz was able and willing to redeem a cursed bride, Today, Christ is willing to do the same and able to do the same, to redeem us from our cursed state of being under the law, under sin. Satan has no, no desire 
to redeem you whatsoever. He wants this world, but he doesn't want you. He seeks to destroy, not to redeem. But our Redeemer loves and can redeem us from the curse under which we are. You see, the law only applies to good people. And bad people can't keep the law. And in case you don't, don't know this, we're all bad people. None of us can keep the law. The law only points to us the fact that you are a sinner. You are under the curse. The penalty you are to pay is death. That's it. It's very simple. No matter what law you broke, the penalty is all the same. Death. That's why Christ died on the Christ on the cross. See, what the law could not do, the love of Christ could do. It met the demands of the law, but the law itself could not satisfy it. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul writes, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. Hmm. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The law. Could you imagine everything you've ever done, written down, and someone standing up here and say, here it is, all of it, and just rolls right down the aisle. Everything you've ever done, all the bad thoughts, all the ill-spoken words, everything, all written down. Notice this, once again, what Christ has done for us, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, or this is all the evidence that's against us. And he took it out of the way, doing what? Nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. Every sin that you have committed or will commit was nailed to the cross. The law could not satisfy, but the love of Christ could. So we see that the redeemed, that being the property, the person, but not only that, the property and the person, the last thing in verses 13 through 22, the posterity. The posterity. Part of the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer was to bring up a posterity for the, the husband that had died, the deceased. He was to have a child, a male child, to which the inheritance could go so that the inheritance would not leave the family. And we have read for us here this morning the account of that taking place. Ruth is redeemed. She conceives. She bears a son. Malon and Elimelech are not without heirs. They now have an heir to which the land can be inherited. And his name is Obed. Obed. And we see the conclusion of the chapter, really the purpose of this book, the writing of it. It reminds us of the genealogy of the unbroken line from this point to David. Those last few verses. Pharez begat Hezron. Hezron begat Amr or Ram and Ram begat Abinadab. Abinadab begat Nashon. Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon who married Rahab, by the way, begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Boaz redeemed the posterity. He gave a posterity. Ruth had no idea in chapter 1 when she said, your God will be my God. She had no idea that her posterity would be a man named David. No idea whatsoever. Christ has redeemed the Christian this morning. He's redeemed this world. He's redeemed you as an individual. But notice there's a posterity. There's a posterity. So what are you saying, preacher? Well, I'm asking you very point blank. 
How many children have you brought into this world spiritually? How many people have you won to Christ? He expects a posterity. He didn't save you just to save you. You are not God's gift to this world. It doesn't stop with you. It doesn't stop with me. He redeemed me so I can tell someone else, amen, and they can hear, and they can receive, and I can have a spiritual child. And then he grows, he matures, and he goes and he shares with somebody else. Who knows who may win the next D.O. Moody? The next Jonathan Edwards. The next great evangelist. The next man that God may raise up to bring revival to our country. But who knows who may turn their back and walk away from the opportunity and leave that great posterity behind. God expects a posterity. He expects us to win others, to have spiritual children, to win others to him. It doesn't stop with me. It doesn't stop with my family. I must reach my neighbors, my friends, strangers, because they're all under the curse. And if they die in their sins, they will spend an eternity in hell. And I will not stand before God guiltless. When he gave that soul to stand before me, and I could have witnessed, I could have been a testimony, but instead, I walked away. Praise God, we have a Redeemer. But he's not just my Redeemer. He is the Redeemer of whosoever will. And it's my responsibility to share it with whosoever walks in the path that I walk today. I'm to share the word of God. I am the watchman that sits on the wall. And I am responsible to warn everyone. It is your responsibility to warn everyone. You can't make them listen. You cannot force them to be saved. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to warn. Their responsibility is how they react to the warning. But the question is, have we been responsible watchmen? Have we been warning others? Or have we just, we just, we just been letting them pass by and not say a word? I said it last week, I'll say it again. It's time for men and the church to stand up. We have to stand up. We must preach the grace of God. We look at the word today and say, oh, we can be all down in the mouth. What in the world are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's still the power of God. Amen? Amen? It is the power of God. He is the redeemer. He's redeemed this land. He's redeemed us as individuals. And we must be responsible. Responsible Christians to share with others. So that we have a posterity that falls behind us. That stands up. And shares the word with others. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. We must share that power. My question once again this morning is, if you're not saved this morning, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you do not know, if you were to take your last breath, heaven will be your home for all eternity. Why are you refusing the gift he wants to give you? Why are you refusing a redeemer? You don't have to. He's already paid the price. All you have to do is accept it. Come to him admitting you're a sinner, admit you need to be redeemed, that Christ died for you, rose again, and you're trusting him for salvation. To save you from your sins, to spend eternity in heaven. Christian, we're such an awesome redeemer. We've been redeemed from so much. He paid an awesome price. Why aren't we telling others? The 
buck stops here. It's our responsibility. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you once again for the precious word of God. We thank you for this little book in the Old Testament called Ruth. Lord, in the, the picture that it portrays for us of you being our redeemer. Lord, I pray this morning we would understand the price that's been paid with the great redemption that we have been partakers of. And that, Lord, we would share it with others so that others may be redeemed, saved from their sins, saved from an eternity in hell. Lord, many times when you look at the world around us, we, we can begin, begin to be overwhelmed and think, what are we going to do? Lord, the answer is always the same. Always the same. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. Lord, but you ask the question yourself, how shall they hear without a preacher? Lord, we need to go. We need to share the word with others. Proclaim the word of God. If we don't, well, they'll never hear. Lord, help us to be laborers in your field. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Allowing your Holy Spirit to work in hearts and lives. Knowing that, Lord, we've fulfilled our responsibility to simply share the word. And let you give the increase. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you and praise God. Let's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I'm going to ask Miss Jane if she would just begin playing.